Bat her up, yeah. First of all, this is a very short bat, so I hope y'all know I have a very tight window. I'm probably going to bunt. <clears throat> 100 and, <clears throat> excuse me. Allergies getting y'all too, right? 127 games. <clears throat> a 202 batting average. About a 30% chance he was going to get on base. Three home runs, 51 RBIs. That was the 1994 season that Michael Jordan, the NBA legend, had with the Birmingham Barons. Now, you read those stats and you say, wow, he's not making an all-star game, right? Uh, not when you've had a lot of other players. But probably one of the more profitable times for the Birmingham Barons was the year 1994 because when Michael showed up, everybody else did too. And everybody thought he is so skilled in basketball and so good, surely he can translate that into baseball. What you don't see about those stats is it was actually way worse in the early part of the year. But what Michael began to do, and before I break something, what Michael began to do, let's do one more thing here. No scares, right? He began to practice hours before the ball games and hours after the ball game. He couldn't help himself. He just he could not be satisfied with being a mediocre player. Now, he was 31 years old. He had accomplished so much in the sport of basketball, and baseball was really his father's dream for him originally. James Jordan wanted Michael to be a baseball player. And Michael's drive and determination and his former manager who became a World Series champion himself, Terry Francona, said the man just, you, you couldn't stop him. He could not stand not to get better, not to work through it. And he suffered a lot of criticism too. I mean, you want to talk about a guy that had the opportunity to say, I quit, this is just really pointless. He did. But instead he kept working, he kept working, he kept working. And eventually he got those numbers up to where he was batting above 200 while we look at it and go, wow, that was pretty bad. He actually became a greater team player to the point of that many of the people in that system said in two years, as a 33-year-old, he will make a rookie for the White Sox and actually probably be a great contributor. But it took practice over and over and over again. We're talking about the encouragement to endure as believers. And endurance requires continual practice. Any of you guys run marathons or run races or have ever run? Okay, I've got a couple folks. All right, so most of you guys are like me. You're like, it ain't worth it. <laughs> I used to run about three miles a day. You look at me and say, <laughs> yeah, all right. I managed to do some pretty good damage to myself, and then I learned there's an easier race. It's the race to see how much I can eat and how fast, right? <laughs> all right, I, I know I'm having a little too much fun this morning, but I am glad to, to be able to share some things, hopefully, that will help you. But in running, I'll tell you this. The max that I ever got up to, I could not run that length or the speed that I did right away. It took practice. It took time. I had to build up endurance. And, and any runner that is going to run a race and have a chance at winning has to practice. They have to practice. It's not an option. No different than our spiritual race that we're running. Paul loved to use that illustration talking about being a runner and setting aside weights and, and doing the things that need to be done to run the race that was before us, to run in such a way that we could win. And guys, today, as we try to build up that spiritual endurance, we've got to continually practice our faith, keep running, keep moving forward in spite of what difficulties or what challenges we may face. And we talked about the Philippian church last week. If you missed out, I'll kind of bring you back up to speed. The Philippian church lived in a city that was not poor, but they themselves were not very rich. And they endured hardship and they endured difficulty. And Paul is writing them at this time to try to encourage them to keep going, keep pushing forward. And the only way to do that, as we read this text this morning, is to practice. Now, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, and I want us to read verses 12 and verse 13 to start us off this morning, and then we'll go through the text in just a little bit. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and verse 13 says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 
Verse 13, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Lord, speak through your word today in Jesus' name, amen. I want to take just a moment and talk about the text that we just read, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. So many people use this text as an opportunity to justify believing a little differently than someone else within the faith. Because I had a conversation with an individual about 2009, and the discussion was this, well, I just believe that every person's got to work out their own salvation. And what they meant was every person's got to figure it out for themselves. Now, that's not 100% false. We have to figure it out on our own. People can't make us believe and can't uh, help us understand the things of God. That has to be something that is a work of the Holy Spirit and the work of God's Word in our lives. But here's the kicker. There's nothing that the Spirit will say to you that will contradict what he's saying to me. There's nothing in the Word of God that you can read that is going to contradict what it says to me through the Spirit of God. And what do I mean by that? Do people see some things differently in the Word of God? Absolutely. Depending on where you are in your faith and in your life and in your walk, there are things that you are going to learn a little differently based on the experiences that God has you to walk through. And you know what the best part is? That's why discipleship is so critical within our churches. We need to walk with each other. It's not leading somebody around and showing them how to do things. Discipleship is walking the path together, encouraging one another, making sure that we're all trying to walk and grow as God would have us to. We encourage each other to practice. One of the things I love about the Jordan story, he said, you know what I liked about being in that? He said, I was one of the guys. He said, I was not a superstar basketball player. He said, they treated me just like one of them. And he said, that was encouragement to him to keep pushing. And guys, think about that in this walk. How often is it? And I'm going to take just a second to jump off script again for just a minute. How often is it we see a fellow believer fail and we sit over there and we just want to start throwing gasoline on that fire. We don't do anything to put it out. Instead, we want to discuss it and talk about it and break down why these people messed up instead of saying, hey, listen, come on, let's get up. Let's walk again. Let's keep going. You can get past this. We're going to walk together through this. Because think about this. If you've been a person like I was, you've fallen a few times, and it, what helped you more than anything else is that one person says, come here, I got you, I got you, come on, get back up, let's go. And Paul is trying to do that to the Philippian church, the things that they endured, and we don't know the depth of it. We get a little bit of a glimpse from the Word of God, but we don't know the depth of what they were dealing with. But he wanted to encourage them to think about how they could continue to practice their faith, build that endurance, and build that strength to just keep going. And can I say this to you guys? If we're ever going to be able to grow in our faith, it's got to be tested. That means difficult times will come. We live in a broken world. We live in a sinful world. We have to battle our own flesh. And we've got to be willing to push forward to keep growing, to keep growing in our faith as well. So in verses 1 through 11, Paul begins to break down the mentality that's needed. Now, I told you guys a little bit about Michael Jordan. I, I'm not, as a human being, I don't know enough about his character. There are things that he said that I wouldn't say, and there's things he's done that I wouldn't do. But I know this much. I respect the mentality that he had when it came to being the best at whatever he did. He did not settle for average, and he was willing to do whatever it took. E even to the point of when he was a young basketball player, he was trying to do all the things that he could to win the game. And as they began to build the team around him and Phil Jackson became his coach, he said, I need you to be more about the team. You don't have to carry it all. We've gotten you the pieces to help you win if you'll be willing to trust your teammates. And that's something that they did. And, and he was a terror in practice, by the way. You read stories about him. He was just brutal in basketball practice. But he wanted to push these guys to be at their absolute best. And his point was, he said, we got to have that same mentality so that we can trust each other when we get on the floor. Guys, if we're going to walk this faith together, we have to depend on each other. We depend on Christ. We depend on the Holy Spirit. But we've got to depend on each other too. Think about who's in this room around you. You may feel like, hey, I've got this okay right now. You know, everybody's got their problems. I've got mine. I'm good. I just kind of keep walking along. That's the kind of thing Satan wants to do to isolate us and to divide us in a way that may not seem so harmful but in truth, we've got to have a mentality of coming together. And verses 1 through verse 4 talks about that, about the unity 
that we need in our mentality. Verse 1 through 4 says, Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 and verse 10 and verse 16, we're going to look at these uh, kind of individually here for just a second, but it says, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. The mentality for this group was that they were going to have to stick together. Wall Highway Baptist Church, can I tell you a truth? If you're going to survive the onslaught of Satan and the work that he's trying to do to disrupt what God wants to do in your life and in this, in this church, you have got to stick together. We have got to stick together as a body of believers and I mentioned something last week talking about the troubles in our denominations. The thing that's easy to do is start aiming at people. You know what I mean? Start sitting there and taking shots. But what we've got to do is come together under the umbrella of Jesus Christ and realize that we're all in this struggle together. We all need Jesus. We all need his word. We all need his spirit. And we all need to be focused on the task that he has given us. And that leads right into John 13, 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have what? love for one another what separates us from any other group we're supposed to love one another we're one big happy family to look around sometimes and go eh, I'm not so sure but that's what we're known for as believers and that's what we have to practice and love is not just the warm and fuzzies for those of us who've been married any length of time and have children you love your family but we can all testify it's not easy. Why? We're all different. The four individuals that make up our household, we're all very different and we all get on each other's nerves. And loving each other is not easy. I love them dearly. And they'll say the same for me. But there are times we get mad. But it's sticking together. It's staying through the difficult times, working through things together, working through scandal, working through division, working through issues within our churches. That's what's going to show the difference because people are just waiting for us to implode. Society would love to see nothing more than churches crumble just so they can say, I told you so. But that love of God that comes in and, and fills a believer's heart and it begins to fill God's church. It's what can make the difference in keeping unity going. Romans chapter 15, verse 1 through 2, and then we'll skip to verses 5 through 7. Listen to what it says. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. That's not to please him. That's not to please somebody or just co-sign to whatever they want to do just so they feel good about themselves. It's looking at the greater spiritual good. We look out for each other's needs. And that's a practice. It's taking care of one another, even though we're all so busy, even though we have so many things we don't want to disrupt us in our times and our lives. Verse 5 through verse 7 says, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another. We heard that earlier in Philippians 2. According to Christ Jesus. Verse 6, So that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Y'all ever heard the saying, and some of you folks that are fishing folks, country folks, you can't clean a fish till you get him in the boat. You understand what I'm saying? You can't eat that fish. You can't get it ready to eat until you get it in the boat. Now, 
using that just a little bit toward the spiritual term. We expect when people come to our church or to the faith not to be messy anymore. But what are we? Hey, truthfully, how many of you guys struggle with wanting to say some things that aren't real nice? Some of those things that they couldn't air on TV. I'll be honest. Man, I could put sailors to shame as a teenager. I work around people who can put sailors to shame, and it is a battle every day to stand out and to fight that. How many of you struggle with looking at things on TV or on the Internet that we shouldn't? Man, these jokers right here are the gateway to freedom, to sin as much as you want to. We've got to be cautious of that. We've got to consider that. We all struggle, and we need to work together. And when this scripture says, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God, we don't accept people's lifestyles that are sinful. Understand that. It's not that we're saying, you know what, we can blur the lines a little bit just so you can be a part of us. Listen, I want you to be a part of this faith family, but I also don't want to sit by and let you struggle and sin and self-destruct, honestly. And the same thing I hope you want from me. But the way we go about it, we work together, we accept one another, knowing just as when I came to Christ, I'm a mess. I'm still a mess that God's working on. But that mindset will help us with our unity. But then verses 5 through 11, let's, let's move on ahead through. We talked about the unity that's required in a mentality that practices to endure, but there's also a mindset of duty. In verse 5 through verse 11, in, in Philippians 2, it says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard, regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Verse 10, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus came here with a purpose, and he was set on his duty. And guys, when we look at our lives as having purpose and having meaning more than just what makes us feel good, it makes us focus a lot better. Better. I'm going to tell you guys, I'm pushing, and we'll talk about this next week, I'm pushing to that day that I satisfy what God has called me here to do and I get to see what I've trusted in my whole life. That's my goal. Serve my purpose. Love God, love people, and lead people to Jesus Christ. That's what we've got to have. Now, I'd love to tell you that's an everyday mentality. Not always true. But that's my duty. And when I get misdirected or when I step off the path, that's what God reminds me of through the Holy Spirit. Look at the attitude of Jesus Christ. He had the ability to get all the accolades, to get everybody's attention, and to put everything on him. But what did he do? He pointed to the Father and everything. Everything was about the Father. Even when people looked at him and he said, if you've seen me, you've seen what? The Father. May people look at our lives and see Jesus Christ because of the way we practice Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 through 14. As Solomon concludes this text that he wrote, everything was vanity up to this point. He realized something. The conclusion when all has been heard is, fear God, keep his commandments. There's our duty. Fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Micah chapter 6 verse 8, he has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, do justice does not mean take justice into our own hands, but it's to do the right thing in every situation. To do what is right regardless of how easy it is on us or how hard it is on us. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29 through 30, Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Any of you guys, and you don't have to raise your hands, any of you guys profess to be wound up tight? <laughs> you follow me long enough and you'll see I can be. All right, people in our house, we can be wound up a little tight. But listen to this. Take the burden, the yoke. The attachment to Jesus onto you. 
that, that level of restraint. For those of you guys who've been in farming, when you think about a yoke, and if any of you guys have ever had the chance to walk behind mules, uh, if you haven't, try it. It's very entertaining, very challenging. Those blinders are important for those animals. But, but you walk behind them with that plow and, and you try to hold it steady. But there's one thing that happens in all this, whether it was the oxen of the day or a mule in our time, that yoke is what restrained them from just running away. That yoke of Jesus Christ, it, it could seem like a burden to a worldly person, but the truth is, it's peace. It's something that gives us trust. While it seems like it's restraining us and a burden, it also keeps us from a lot of things that can go badly. That duty that we have is to take the yoke of Christ upon us, to do the right thing even when it's not easy, to fear God, to keep his commandments. That's the mindset, a mindset of unity and duty. But then we look at verses 12 through verse 18 and we look at the method. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And when we looked at that scripture just a minute ago, there's a picture here of reverence because it talks about work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We have to reverently serve God. We don't flippantly do it. We do it understanding who we're giving an offering to. Had a great conversation with a cohort of mine in Montgomery. We're working in the same program, and he's our statewide director and I appreciate a lot of things he does. We don't always see eye to eye, but we try to talk these things out. And, and we took a minute just to kind of get serious about faith. He's a person of faith as well. Now, one of the things he said, you know what changed my mindset about this job as much as it frustrates me? He said, when I realize it's an opportunity to worship God right where I stand. He said, when I give my service to this department as an idea of a way to serve God, to give worship to God. He said, that changed my mindset. It changed my work ethic a little bit too because I don't want to half give anything to God. In Malachi, remember when people were bringing lame offerings, offerings of animals that were sick, that were maybe had a broke leg or had a, a, little, giddy, a little hitch in their giddy up. And I mean, these were the kind of things they were laying before God because they didn't want to give their best. And God said, if the governor demanded a, this of you, would he be pleased? And he's making the implication that people sometimes treat God as a second thought. And what begins to happen when things get difficult? We begin to try to take control of the reins. God, I know how to handle this. Just, just let me do this and, and bless what I'm doing. I got this. When I serve God, I have to do it with a great degree of reverence for it to be pleasing in his sight. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Paul was a superstar in the Jewish faith before he came to Christ. He was going to be the next great teacher, great legend. He was on track for that. And if anybody had a reason to brag about who he was, Paul did. But notice what he said. It's just the grace of God that I am what I am, that I'm able to be a part of what I'm doing. Guys, that's my story today. There's nothing great about me save Jesus Christ and his grace. I'm a trophy and a presentation of his grace. The fact that I still get to live today, the fact that you still get to live today is proof of his grace. We reverently serve. But then in verse 14 through verse 16, we look at how we graciously shine. Do all things without grumbling or disputing in verse 14. Verse 15, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Among whom you appear as lights in the world. Holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. Now, that passage, what we read, and it's just so funny to me that those verses group together and they, they sound a lot like another verse, four through verse 14 through verse 16, and that's Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and 
glorify your Father who is in heaven. I'm going to heap praise on you, Pastor, for a minute. I know this, this is not a sermon about Alan Hayes, but I love the guy. And I want to do this. I'm going to tell you this, what you may have already experienced. I hope you have by now. I've never dealt with a more gracious mindset than Alan Hayes has. And everything, when we would talk about difficulties in the church, and we would have those sessions, and sometimes it'd be me venting, it'd be somebody else venting, and every now and again he might vent a little bit, but he said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to be gracious above everything else. We're going to handle this with grace. Everything was always handle it with grace. And there would be times I would be like, I can't stand you right now. Because this ain't what I want to do. I'd like to throw this table across the room and just get it out of my system. Now, while that may have been a private conversation, would that have shined the light of Jesus? No. My temper can do more damage than anything else. It looks more like a blowtorch than a candle lighting the way, <laughs> burning everything down around it. <laughs> but my call on my life is, look at verse 14 again of Philippians chapter 2. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. You guys went through a renovation process, and I hope to high heaven it didn't get too difficult because what throws those things into a really bad loop? It's when we start picking out carpet <laughs> and paint colors, and there's somebody not going to be happy, and they're going to leave and go to the church with the green-colored walls instead of the gray-colored walls. Grumblings and disputing, that's what the people see outside of our church. But what happens when we come together and we live that life so that we're blameless and innocent, proving to be children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation? The reason the people get so upset with us is because we're acting just like them and we say we're not. Shine as lights. Let your light shine before men in such a way that people will see our good works. And what will they do? They'll point. There must be something to this God they're talking about. There must be something to this Jesus. Verse 17, verse 18 talks about how we joyfully sacrifice as part of the method of our practice. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Paul appreciated the fact that he was being beaten. That makes no sense. Some people would call him sadistic. But what he understood was this, that Christ suffered for all of mankind. And he even said that no servant is greater than the master. And if he suffered, we have to suffer in some form or fashion. Paul looked at what God was doing through his suffering and he appreciated it. And he was willing to sacrifice. Colossians 1.24 says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. He said, I'm willing to suffer on your behalf for your growth and for the spread of the gospel. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. It was worth suffering if it led someone to Jesus Christ. Do you want to know why the churches across the oceans that are suffering great persecution are growing at alarming rates way faster than anything here in the Western Hemisphere? It's because people see the suffering of these servants and they understand that there is something legitimate to what they're doing. Either that or they're absolutely crazy. And it makes them curious enough. And, and even some of the captors and some of the people who persecuted and beaten and murdered and martyred those believers, they're coming to Jesus Christ because they see the difference and the willingness that these people have to sacrifice. Guys, we have a hard time getting up on Sunday morning just to come to church. We have a hard time gathering volunteers to serve in some of these things y'all are talking about on the screen. It shouldn't be anything to sacrifice just a little bit of time. For Jesus. And we do it with joy. Well, I got to go to that community service project we got lined up. Um, yeah, I'm going to be unavailable. We can't go do that trip today. I'm sorry. We just, we're, just, we're just so tied up. 
What, what would be the difference in the attitude that we should have in that situation? Man, I hate I can't go with you, but listen, we're going to this, uh, this opportunity here to go share the love of Jesus with people. Hey, won't you come with us? And then maybe we could do that after? That's not what we think about, is it? That's not how we're wired to think. Sometimes it's a mindset change that we have to have, that mentality that turns into a different method of how we've done things. Church could look a lot different if we'd realize sometimes we've got to change our methods. We've got to be more reverent in our service. We've got to graciously shine the light of Jesus to people, and we've got to be joyful in our sacrifices for him. And lastly, let's talk about the ministry in practice. Verse 19 through verse 29, we break this down. I'm going to read a couple different passages together here in verse 19 through 21 and then verse 25 through verse 28. 19 through 21 says this in Philippians 2. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I may also, also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who would genu genuinely, pardon me, sorry y'all, be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. Then let's skip down to verse 25 through verse 28. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. He hated that it bothered them, honestly. And finishing on through verse 28, for indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. He's basically saying in all this, we've got people that are worried about you guys. There are people who don't care, but we do. I want to go back to and revisit a topic we were talking about just a second ago. Church, let's quit shooting our wounded. When somebody messes up, what do we do? Pick them up. Pick them up. Pick them up and love them in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, 24, Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. We need to reinvigorate that concern for one another. Let's look at what's really going on in people's lives and invest in them again. That's ministry. You want to make a difference in this neighborhood? Don't just invite them to everything you got going on. Really invest in them. Get to know who they are. If you want to make a difference in Madison, Alabama, Madison County, Northeast Alabama, the northern portion of Alabama, southern Middle Tennessee, whatever the range is, the whole world, then let's really be concerned about people's needs and what's going on in their lives. Paul was suffering, but yet he was still concerned for them. His, his brothers were suffering. I think it was Epaphroditus that he said that he had gotten sick. And he was upset that it distressed the church that he was sick. He's like, man, I, I didn't want to bother anybody. Can we have that kind of concern that is selfless toward one another? But another part of ministry that's difficult for us is deferring to leadership. Deferring to leadership, first of all, of the Holy Spirit. And you know one of the best things I love about my life right now is I don't have to be in charge. <laughs> I didn't have to be anyway. But I always thought I did. I always thought, man, this is, this is your territory. This student ministry, man, you gotta, this has got to be have your handprint all over it. This has got to be under control. This church that you pastored, it's got to have your thumbprints all over it, and it's got to be under your control. That's a lie from the pits of Satan's home himself. I mean, he, 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 listen, I don't have to be in control. I don't care to lead when God calls. If nobody else will step up, Man, I, I can be Elijah. I can say, I'll go, sure. But I don't have to be. It, it's a mindset of how can we work together to do what God wants us to do. Church, every ministry you do is important when led by the Holy Spirit. Encourage each ministry. Lift it up. Don't get territorial. This ain't just the youth kingdom, the children's kingdom, the senior adults kingdom. This ain't just the music kingdom. Everything is here working together as a part of the body of Christ. And it's okay not to have my way or your way. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15 through 18 says, Now I urge you, brethren, 
You know the household of Stephanus, that they were the first fruits of Achaia, and they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints, that you also be in subjection to such men and to everyone who helps in the work and labors. I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have supplied what was lacking on your part, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. He's saying defer to the leadership of these people. They have served people. The greatest among us will be our what? Our servants. Those who serve Christ. Go back to the text that we had in Philippians chapter 2, verse 22 through 24. He's talking about... <clears throat> Back up here for just a second to get my names mixed up. He's talking about Timothy. In verse 22, he says, But you know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself will be coming to you shortly. And then verse 29, he says, Receive him. And he's talking about Epaphroditus at this point. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Paul is acknowledging the service and the servant attitude of these people, that mentality that helps people push through difficulty. And he's saying, listen to them. The best example among us is the servant. So I ask you this today. Are you continuously practicing your faith? Are you serving God graciously, reverently, in honor toward him? Do we have that mindset, that mentality of Jesus Christ? I go back to what we said last week. Some of us today, you may be hearing this and saying, this just doesn't resonate with me. I, I don't understand how this works. And, and, and can I encourage you to do something? Are you walking with Jesus Christ? Has there ever been a time that you've receive that gift of grace from him if not today is the day and let me tell you it's very easy if, if the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart in this manner today it's so easy that it's just simply acknowledging who you are as a sinner that you're insufficient of yourself to please God and that we trust the work that Christ did when he lived a perfect life he died on the cross and he rose from the grave on the third day and we know that he's seated at the right hand of God and it's a willingness to follow him to confess him as Lord and Savior and to follow him. To change the direction of your life. That's what it's about. For some it may be that I'm a believer. But I've not been practicing very well. In fact, if I was on a pro team, they'd probably cut me. My stats look worse than Michael Jordan's right now in baseball. It may be where you are. If it is, you can, you can get better than that today. You, you can be walking in a, in a better walk. You can be improving in your faith, but you got to surrender. It's all about surrender to Almighty God. Today, there may be some call on your life. I don't know what it is. Maybe God's calling you to missions, one of my favorite places to be. Maybe God's calling you just to, to go and be an encourager to people, to be different at work, to be different in your neighborhood, to be different in your school. What's he calling you to do? You may be that person that's discouraged Hold on, hold on. And church, take note. Look around, be aware of what's going on and be ready to encourage because we're gonna need each other. The times are not getting easier, they're getting harder. And we need to practice together. We need those people who will step up and say, come on, let's do this, we got this. Let's bow our heads and let's have a time of prayer as we prepare for an opportunity for you to respond publicly. Stand with us if you would at this time. Caleb is going to be down front, ready to receive anyone today. If you have anything that you would like to share with him or you need him to pray over, there may be others here, somebody next to you that you want to pray with you. We want to encourage you to do that today. But every head bowed and every eye closed as they begin to prepare for this time. And we pray. Thank you, God, for your grace, for your mercy. Thank you for your strength in times of difficulty and and being there for us when we need you. And, and God, today, there may be someone here who's crying out, I, I need you, Lord. I've never had that relationship with you. I've never had that peace. 
I've never experienced that joy. God, stir in their heart today. Help them to have courage to step out and make a public decision to share with someone here in the room, to share with this whole faith family about your call in their life. Lord, there may be someone here who's being called to some sort of ministry or may be being called back from a life that has been such that they're, they're running away from you. They're living a life that it's not pleasing to you. Lord, draw them back in. God, for that heart that's discouraged, lift them up today. Help them to know that you're going to walk with us through every fire and every trial. You truly are that way maker. And God, as we proceed further in this time, there may be people who are walking and they're on fire and they're loving you and they're loving people and they're just serving you every way they can. Lord, I pray you keep their heart encouraged. But above everything else, Lord, have your will and your way.